Every man dies, not every man really lives. Those are the words of Mel Gibson as he played William Wallace in Braveheart. I've heard that used a lot. Every man dies, but not every man really lives. Why? Because it resonates with us. As people, we want to really live. We don't want our life to mean nothing, right? So when I was in college, people wanted to make their life count for something. And so there's this phrase that was going around. It was a really dumb phrase, but people would say all the time. And it was really more of an acronym, YOLO. You only live once. And usually that was because they were about to do something really stupid or about to spend more money than what they had. So uh, you only live once. They, They wanted to make their life worth something. As Christians, we should desire our lives to mean something. We should desire to live lives that have meaning. And actually, we've been promised by Jesus Christ that through him we can have abundant life. We can live life to the fullest. He says that in John 10.10. Now certainly this life is referring to the new heavens and the new earth. If you didn't join us the last couple weeks, we've been walking in a series through heaven. Heaven is for real. We're really going there if we know Jesus. So certainly Jesus is saying, in me you're going to have life, eternal life, that's going to be better than anything on this earth. But what about the here and now? Does Jesus' words and his promise in John 10, 10, that he came to give us life to the fullest, does that apply to us right now in 2022 at a Boyd Baptist church? Absolutely. For the last year and a half or so, we've been using this mantra, living on mission for Jesus. In fact, we printed t-shirts that say, living on mission for Jesus. You've heard me preach many sermons saying, living on mission for Jesus. But what does that mean? What does that mean for us to live on mission for Jesus? Yes, we know, we've talked about it before, that that comes from John 20, 21, where Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Right? We're on a mission from God, and we're not the Blues Brothers, right? Right? We're on a mission from God to go and live on mission. But what does that mean? What does that look like? Well, I would say that it looks like bagpipes in Babylon. You see, uh, we're going to read Daniel chapter 3 here in a second. And you'll notice that bagpipes are, are listed. They seem out of place. After all, we think of bagpipes, we think of Scotland. But here we're in the Middle East, modern day Iraq, And we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego hearing the bagpipes and and other instruments. And as the bagpipes have a shrill tone, I like the bagpipes, but they have a shrill tone. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to stand out with a shrill to the million or so people who bow down to the idol. Friends, how we are called to live on mission for Jesus is to live in our day and age with resiliency, with boldness, with courage, with conviction. It it takes just a little exposure to the television news, social media, or other various forms of our digital aid to show us that what we're living in is what David Kinnaman and Mark Matlock call a digital Babylon. This digital Babylon consists of our online world. Most of us have supercomputers in our pockets. We go online, we we see the news, we're connected with the world more than we've ever been connected, and we see that this this world is just not as it should be. And, and, And we are drawn still to this earth. In fact, 68% of kids raised in the church, I'm not talking about others outside the church, 68% of children raised in the church, they leave or they stop following Christ after two years graduating from high school. The average 15 to 23 year old uses screen media in its various forms for 2,767 hours a year, or 115.29 days. Where do we live here and now? We live in a digital battle. 
we look, internet, social media, different apps, that's where we live. And in this digital babble, if we're in Christ. Sojourners, this world is not our home. But church goer, you know how much time not just reading their Bible, but going to church or praying or or listening to, to Christ's content or just even having faith how much time they spend doing 291 hours in a year on average, which is 12.125. Compare that to 115. How do we live in this digital Babylon? Many of you have been feeling this tension for a while. In fact, you will resonate with what Mary Eberstadt wrote in Time article in 2016 entitled, Regular Christians Are No Longer Welcome in American Culture. She says this, This new vigorous secularism has catapulted mockery of Christianity and other forms of religious traditionalism into the mainstream and set a new low for what counts as civil criticism of people's most cherished beliefs. In some precincts, the faith of our fathers is controversial as never before. Some of the faithful have paid unexpected prices for their beliefs lately, The teacher in New Jersey suspended for giving a student a Bible. The football coach in Washington placed on leave for saying a prayer on the field at the end of a game. The fire chief in Atlanta fired for self-publishing a book defending Christian moral teaching. The Marine court martyred for pasting a Bible above her desk. And other of the new Christian activists like bigot and hater at American additional Abortion Christians of some face pressure to conform to secularist ideology or else. Flagship evangelical schools like Gordon College in Massachusetts and King's College in New York have had secular secularist are schools don't accreditation period. Activists have targeted homeschooling Christian things. Hawkins and others have tantamount to child abuse. Student groups like InterVarsity have been kicked off campuses. Christian charities, including adoption agencies, Catholic hospitals, and crisis pregnancy centers, have become objects of attack. Friends, this article was written in 2016. Six years was not that long. My son, my oldest, Kyle, was born, and he's getting ready to start kindergarten. Only worse. And even in recent events of the Oberfeld case, we've seen more vitriol toward biblical stances for truth. Now, with all of this going on, how are we to live on mission for Jesus? With difficulty. Rod Dreher wrote a book called Live Not By Lies. He interviewed a bunch of people who were pastors or Christians during the Iron Curtain, during the Soviet era. And as he interviewed one of the pastors, Kirill Kalita, he said, how did you live for truth in a state that hated Christianity? And he says, of course it's difficult, but thanks be to God, there were people who were doing their best to build their lives in such a way that they could live in truth. People understood that if that was going to be a priority to live in truth, then they were going to have to limit themselves in other ways. The progress of their careers, for example. But they made a choice and resolved to live in truth. Friends, what we've experienced in America for the last 400 or so years, it's an anomaly in church history. It's an anomaly for the people of God. Most of the time throughout human history, God's people have not had prestige because they followed God. In fact, hopefully you're in your Bibles in Daniel chapter 3, we're going to see some men who live not in a digital Babylon, but a physical Babylon, who were exiles and who were pressured to give in to the idol of their day. What do they do? Well, they stand out. Let's read in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel 3, starting in verse 1. 
King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the hornpipe, lyre, trogon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, It is true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, We have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. This is the word of God, and it is very profitable for us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were familiar with this. Um, In fact, I think they're going to inform us with our big idea this morning that how we live missionally for Jesus, you live on mission by adoring Christ, building bridges, and creating disciples. Okay? And what we're doing this morning is I want to introduce to you the pillars of what our church is going to be individually. We need to be people who are adoring Christ. We need to be people who are building bridges. We need to be people who are creating disciples. As a church body, we're going to look at our our programs, the things that we do, and we're going to look through a filter of, are we adoring Christ? Are we building bridges? Are we creating disciples? And I think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego give us a great example of what it looks like to do this. These three young men were, if they were any older than teenagers, were not much older than teenagers. They had been taken from Nebuchadnezzar in one of his raids of Judah. They had been raised to love the Lord, Yahweh, and to serve him in truth. They were taken out of their land, brought to Babylon, and installed in a school for three years where they would be re-educated. But we're familiar with Daniel chapter 1. Daniel their friend, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, even though they were given new names, they did not forget their God. They served him. So they had the, the, what we call the Daniel diet. They just ate vegetables. 
And they were healthier than anyone else. Why did they do that? Because they refused to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols. They wanted to follow the truth. They were promoted. Then in Daniel chapter 2, um, everybody was in big trouble because Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and he wanted it interpreted, but nobody knew what the dream was. Nebuchadnezzar wouldn't tell them. And so everyone's getting ready to be killed, all the people that work for Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, the, the soldiers knock on Daniel and Shadrach Meshach's door, and Abednego's door, and say, well, Nebuchadnezzar's going to kill you. Well, why? <laughs> what do we do? Well, he has a dream. No one can interpret it. No one knows what it is. And Daniel says, give us a second. They pray. Daniel goes before Nebuchadnezzar, and he explains the dream. He explains that there was a big, golden, or a big statue with a golden head, and Nebuchadnezzar was that golden head, and it represented all the kingdoms of the earth, and that God was going to ultimately destroy that idol, destroy that statue. Well, Nebuchadnezzar is very pleased with Daniel. That's exactly what the dream was. He interpreted the dream, and Daniel was promoted. That's actually how chapter 2 ends. Daniel's promoted, and his buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are promoted. But not so long after that, these young men have to face another decision. In Daniel chapter 3, we see that Nebuchadnezzar is hard-headed. Nebuchadnezzar, even saying some remarkable things about God in chapter 2, he still has not acknowledged the Lord as Lord. He just says he's one of many gods. It's acceptable for you, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to, to worship your Lord. But I'm going to create an image, a really big image, 90 feet high, nine feet wide, probably had a, a firm base of a foundation. It was an image made to be worshiped. We see in uh, verse four of chapter three, it says, and the herald proclaimed aloud, you're commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages. There's something very deep going on here because they're just outside of Babylon in the, in the plains. Scholars believe that there would have been about a million people or so, at least hundreds of thousands of people that were gathered together to, to worship and bow down at Nebuchadnezzar's idol. And many of the nations and peoples were gathered there. But guess what? This isn't the first time that the peoples have been gathered in the plains around Babylon. You guys remember Genesis chapter 11? The Tower of Babel? You see, at one point in Genesis, the peoples of the earth, they wanted to make their name great. They wanted to be lifted up. They said, we will do better than God. And so they gathered together to create a tower to say, we as people are great. Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel. But God says, no, 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 man, you are not going to redeem yourself. I'm going to redeem you. Because then in Genesis chapter 12, he finds a man named Abram, and he says, Abram, through your seed, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. We've talked about the ultimate fulfillment through Jesus Christ the last four weeks as we talked about heaven. In Revelation chapter 21, we know that every tribe, tongue, and nation is going to be in heaven and be worshiping Jesus and God the Father but that time hasn't come yet. Right here in Daniel chapter 3, we see subterfuge. We, we see man trying to build himself up and to redeem the nations in his own way, like King Nebuchadnezzar, who thought of himself as a god. So he builds this big statue, and he gathers the people, and he says, worship, or I'll kill you. And can you imagine a million people bowing down all at once when they hear all the various tunage? Except three young men. Now some people say, where, where was Daniel? I don't know, the Bible doesn't say. We can guess. He was promoted to a high position. He could have been away on business. He might have been standing right next to King Nebuchadnezzar, in which case he wouldn't have had to bow down. I don't think Daniel bowed down because the rest of the book of Daniel doesn't ever show us Daniel bowing down to anything. He's very faithful. But we don't know where Daniel is, but we know where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are. They're not bowing. 
Now, I think there was some anti-Semitism, right, by the Chaldeans. After all, the Chaldeans were Babylonians. That's just another name for Babylonians. They were raised there in the capital city. They had served Nebuchadnezzar. But now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were promoted to super high positions. And are you kidding me? They're not even following the rules. So what do they do? They go to the king. And they address the king, oh, sweetly. Oh, king, there's some Jews out there that are not bowing down to you. Now, we know that the king knows who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are because the rule was if you don't bow down, you're immediately thrown into the furnace. But Nebuchadnezzar knows Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He has a soft spot for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's probably because Daniel is Nebuchadnezzar's right-hand man. So Nebuchadnezzar brings him up. And he says, hey, maybe you don't get the point here, guys. When you hear the music, bow down. Maybe you weren't ready. Okay, so I'm going to do it again. And you bow down. And if you don't, I'm going to kill you. What a choice, right? I stopped reading in Daniel 3 at verse 16 through 18. Because it is here that we see the resilient faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are given an option, die or worship idols. And what do they choose? What do they say? They say, oh, king, we don't even have to conference together. We're not going to bow down to you or your idols. We serve the living God who is able to rescue us from the fiery furnace. And even if he doesn't, he's still good. Well, the rest of the story, and for the sake of time, I'm going to summarize. The rest of the story is they don't bow down, right? And they're thrown into a furnace, a furnace that's heated up as hot as it possibly can get. And they're thrown into a furnace, like up on a stage, down into the furnace. But it's so hot that the men who throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they die. And Nebuchadnezzar, the wicked and cruel king that he is, he's watching that furnace he has a little window into it, and he's ready to see them burn, to melt. Except that doesn't happen. Nebuchadnezzar is shocked. He says, didn't we only throw three men into the furnace? And there's four men there, and one of them looks like a son of the gods. And he calls Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to go out. And they come out, and they're not singed. Their clothes don't smell like fire. The hair on their head is all still there. Nebuchadnezzar ends up again confessing, wow, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he's not just one of many gods, he is the greatest of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar's still not there yet. And he promotes Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What does that mean for us? What does that mean for us in the year 2022? What does that mean for us as, as we live our lives trying to live on mission for Jesus? The principles that I think that we see in Daniel chapter 3 apply so much to us. And the first is adoring Christ. You see, as, as we live on mission for Jesus, we are called to adore Christ. We are called to serve him, to serve our God, the God who came down on our behalf, who, who went to the cross for our sin, who, who died on the cross, taking away our sin, our shame, our guilt, and rose again on the third day. It is through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone that we can be connected to God the Father. And that's who we're called to adore. Now, we may not use the word adore very often. What it means is worship. We are called to worship Christ. Worship Christ in all that we do. But that's hard because we live in a world of idols. I think in Daniel chapter 3, we, we see a couple of different of idols, uh, one of which is ourselves. Nebuchadnezzar makes a big old statue to himself. He worships himself. Friends, we live in a selfie age, right? We worship ourselves. And we're called as Christians, not to worship ourselves, not to adore ourselves, but to adore Christ. 
We're called to live for Christ. I, I think, though, we also see in Daniel 3 the idol of conformity. We see all these people, all these magistrates, all these people in Nebuchadnezzar's government, the, the peoples, the world, bowing down to a false idol. They were conformed to the idol of their age. And friends, there is something that we are called as Christians right now. The world is beckoning us to conform to the idols of the age. But friends, we're called to adore Christ. We're called to worship Christ and Christ exclusively. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. When we share the gospel and when we live out the gospel, we are not to say Jesus plus anything. It's not Jesus plus good works. It's not Jesus plus Buddha. It's not Jesus plus the social agenda of the age. It is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And as we adore Christ, we are called to exclusively live for him. What does that look like? Well, it looks like these three boys who stood resiliently for their Lord. We live in a pluralistic society we live in a pluralistic society that says it's okay to believe in Jesus. After all, haven't you seen the blue bumper stickers? Coexist? There's a cross in the coexist, right? You can live and believe in Jesus, but man, give the rest of us a break. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not get thrown in the fire because they were following the Lord. They got thrown in the fire because they refused to bend a knee to the idols of their age. That's why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the furnace. They refused to bend their knee. And if we as Christians are going to worship Christ, we must refuse to bend a knee to the idols of our age, whether it's the own idols of our own making and our own heart or the idols that are thrown upon us to conform. We only have to look at the sexual ethics of our day. All the alphabet soup that's thrown around us. Premarital sex. You know, they don't mind it if you worship Jesus. And it might be weird for, for a guy like a Tim Tebow. He got made fun of, right? He was saving sex for marriage. And he was made fun of for that, but that's okay if you do that over there. But don't tell me how to live my life. Well, friends, we don't tell anyone how to live their lives. God does. And there is God's truth. And God's truth is absolute. Would it be easier for us just to conform? Would it be easier for us just to say, live your life however you want to live? Absolutely. But the Bible does not allow us to do that. The Bible is very clear on how we are to approach a sexual ethic. And that's just one example. The second pillar of how we live on mission for Jesus is building bridges. You might call this uh, being missional. We want to build bridges to people who are not Christians. But you say, how in the world are we to build bridges with people who aren't Christians if we're going to say, no, this is the truth, this is God's word? Well, friends, how we build bridges, how we build bridges that last is by standing on the truth. John 1.14, Jesus gives us a perfect example of how we are to live on mission. And it says that Jesus came full of grace and truth. We love our neighbors. We love our coworkers. We love those people, but we must stand for truth. And that's hard. People say, if you tell me what the Bible says, and I don't agree with it, that's not loving. But friends, that is the most loving thing that you could possibly do. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't bend or bow to the idol. And that was the most loving thing that they could have ever done to Nebuchadnezzar. I do believe that in Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar finally and ultimately bends his knee to the Lord. That day wasn't there yet. But imagine if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had never stood Imagine if Daniel had never stood. Would, they have any, would Nebuchadnezzar have had any influences pointing him to the Lord? 
Friends, my son Hezekiah is almost six years old. And if he were outside playing with matches, what is the responsible thing to do? To go and tell him to stop. He's not a fireman. He's not 20 years old. He's almost six. Six Six-year-olds should not be playing with matches. But what the world is telling us as believers is don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me how to live. But we're not doing it. It's what God's word says. And we live on truth. We stand on truth. How do we do that? Well, I think their response in verse 16 and 18 is is very accurate. Let's read those verses again. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Friends, we have a call as believers to build bridges, but we don't build those bridges on lies. We build those bridges on truth. Because what happened in the Soviet era in Moscow in 1973, when it was pretty much illegal to be a Christ follower, there was a man named Father Dmitri. Father Dmitri would answer the questions of people about truth, and he was unyielding in them. He would answer questions publicly. He drew atheists and intellectuals, Christians and Jews and Marxists, because he would tell people the truth. So much so that the Soviet Union had to go after him. He was unyielding in it. Our day and age looks like an SNL comedy sketch. Some people have to stand up and say, this is the truth. Because I think in, in our hearts, people are looking for truth. And friends, if you're in Christ, you know the truth. But how can we be bold? How can we build those bridges? How can we do that? How can we be the Shadrach, Meshachs, and Abednego's of our age? Well, you see, the story of Daniel chapter 3 started when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were young. It started with their parents making disciples. And that's our third and final pillar that we are called to create disciples. It starts in the family, and it goes out from there. You you see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had parents who would tell them the Shema. They would tell them the Shema each and every day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They would talk with their parents as as they traveled around. They would hear the law of the Lord and know this is how we must live. And there weren't a lot of people in Judah of their day that were following the Lord, but their parents were. And we know that because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego follow after the Lord. Friends, we are called to create disciples. You want to know how to live on mission for Jesus? Invest in your children. You want to know how to live on mission for Jesus? Invest in your neighbors, invest in your coworkers, invest in your friends. It starts with the people that are around you. After all, God put them in your life so that you can bear witness to his truth. Sometimes when we talk about living on mission for Jesus, you think that you have to go like Zach Huffines. You have to go to a foreign nation, to Costa Rica. And I'll tell you what, I I love missions. I love the nations. I want every person in the world to know about Jesus. But most of you are not called to the nations. Most of you are called to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and that sounds really boring, but guess what? That's where God puts you. So live for him here. Live for him now. Resolve to be an obedient follower of Christ, worshiping him, building bridges with others, standing for truth. We can't expect the world to understand this, but when the world looks at us, they're going to see something different. I could have preached out of many different passages for this sermon, one of which passage is Acts chapter 2, the early church. 3,000 were added that day after Pentecost. And then what did they get doing? They had fear and reverence of the Lord. And as they had fear and reverence of the Lord, they heard the apostles' teaching, they prayed, they broke bread, and they were persecuted. They suffered for Jesus. 
One of the greatest examples throughout church history of creating disciples is the suffering, having that resilient faith. We don't like to talk about suffering. After all, we're Americans. We have rights. The Apostle Paul had rights as well, and he used them. Some people want to remove themselves from culture so much and just say, well, it's the United States of America. It's, it's going to hell in a handbasket. I'm just going to remove myself. That's not what we're called to do either. Friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego served Babylon better than the Babylonians. That's why they're in the position that they were. That's why Daniel was in the position that he was. But they knew that this Babylon was not their home. And friends, our digital Babylon, our Babylon that we live in the United States, it's not our home if we are in Christ. Our home is in heaven. Our home is with the Lord. And we're called to be citizens of heaven. We're called to be living our mission for Jesus each and every day. And there's a plethora of ministry opportunities here at the church as we've looked, how do we live on mission for Jesus? You need help in doing that? Men, you need help in doing that? We have discipleship groups, D groups, where we pray with one another, where we encourage one another, where we say we want to live on mission for Jesus. We have covenanters for the men. I mean, it's the third Saturday of every single month. Show up to those. If you want to start living for Jesus and have brothers in Christ helping you live for Jesus, show up to those. Women, we have a Titus 2 ministry. We've had Bible studies, and they don't just have Bible studies in the morning. They have Bible studies in the morning and in the afternoon and at night on Thursday nights throughout most of the year. You want to know how to live for Jesus? Do that. Because it is by creating disciples that then our hearts are stirred with affections for Christ that we'll start adoring him, and then we start building those bridges in truth. Friends, we are called to be like bagpipes, shrill in our age with the truth.